I guess we'll get uh, started now. Uh, my name is Bob Zierlich, and on behalf of the Manistee Area Key Party, I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, we will begin with uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if everyone will bow our heads, uh, Father God, the one and only true God, giver of all life, truth, wisdom, and love, we come humbly before you, thankful for the United States of America and the Constitution that you gave our founders. Heavenly Father, we pray for revival in our land and a return to your precepts. Every nation that has denied you no longer exists. We pray for your guidance here tonight to help us to be able to do something to bring our country back to some sense of sanity, that we may leave it in better condition for our children and grandchildren. As a people, we ask for your blessing and your wisdom tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, um, our speaker tonight is Jason Hay. Uh, we've got a couple of announcements to make. Uh, first of all, uh, due to a decrease in attendance, the Wellington Area Department will be holding their last meeting next month. Um, as you know, both uh, Rod Merrill and Rose Duluth are, have been board members here and in Ludington. Uh, so that uh, we have invited all of the Ludington people to join us starting next year. So hopefully in January we will see some new faces uh, coming. Welcome us. Uh, Rod combined, got the email list combined, combined so we added another 116 people to our email address. Uh, so anyhow, just uh, we hope we will see new faces starting in January and uh, kind of welcome them when they come. Okay, with that, I think well, our speaker tonight is Jason Hay. He's our newly elected Annecy County Prosecuting Attorney. Uh, maybe one of the reasons we asked Jason here tonight for was to talk about what happens when someone is involved in a crime and is arrested and to walk us through the whole system, which is pretty much going through what this department does. So that's going to be his main topic tonight, and then uh, whatever else he wants to talk to us about. So with that, welcome to Jason Hay. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everybody, for having me here tonight. Um, when originally I was approached by Tom and Bob to come and speak, uh, I was a little bit concerned because I knew that I had to fill an hour or close to it. And I came home and I told my wife, Carrie, I said, I need to fill an hour. And she immediately looked at me and said, oh, you'll have no problem talking for an hour. So I, I don't know if, that, if, if you know, I should be insulted by that or if that's a good thing. But um, I was told that I should open with a joke, and I thought, uh, what would be more appropriate than telling a lawyer joke um, as the uh, newly elected prosecuting attorney up here? So um, the problem is the only one that I could think of was one you've probably all heard. What do you call 5,000 lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? Good start. A good start, yes. Good start. Yeah, so, um, but, Basically what I'd like to do is I'd like to start talking about how the office is set up, um, the employees that we have, uh, and basically um, in our office we have three attorneys. We have the elected prosecutor, we have the chief assistant, and then we have an assistant prosecutor. We also have two and a half support staff. Uh, we have two individuals that do legal and clerical work um, full time, and then there is one person that's half time uh, that does victim witness uh, 
notifications, meeting with uh, witnesses, setting up uh, things that witnesses and victims may need on cases. Um, and I'd like to start out talking about the duties of the office. Uh, the first one is pretty obvious, I think, for everybody. Uh, we prosecute criminal cases. Um, and basically the criminal cases that we prosecute can be broken down into two types. There's obviously the felony and there's the misdemeanor. Felony cases are anything that is punishable by over a year. Um, so that would be a year in prison. Uh, anything a year or under would be a misdemeanor case, and that jail time would occur at the county jail. The types of common felony cases that we see here in Manistee County um, are theft crimes, uh, home invasions, uh, we see a lot of drug cases. Uh, recently, we've seen kind of an uptick in criminal sexual conduct cases. Uh, and I, I'm sure most of you have read about some of those in the papers. Um, unfortunately, uh, that type of thing is becoming all too common. Um, and uh, so we do what we can to uh, send those people away. Uh, the types of misdemeanor cases that we see uh, often are assaults, drug drivings, domestic violence. Uh, there's a lot of those types of cases, some low-level drug type cases. Uh, Manistee County is a little bit unique um, in that there are a couple of things that we have here that they don't have in other counties. We have a casino um, and we have a prison. And as it regards the prison, we do take a lot of cases from the prison. Oftentimes there are prisoners possessing weapons out there. Uh, those all go to us. There are fights, there are stabbings, um, officers get assaulted from time to time. Um, and I don't want to make it sound like a lawless place out there. It's not. They're, they're housing a lot of people. Um, and so we do get a lot of those cases. And we also get things from the casino from time to time. Thefts, drug cases, uh, and those types of things. Um, as it regards the misdemeanor cases, um, there is something in Manistee County that a lot of places don't have. Um, and that is uh, Tippy Dam. So anybody who's a fisherman who knows um, this time of year and knows the fall knows how busy Tippy Dam gets. And uh, we do see uh, a lot of, of snagging tickets. We see drug cases. We see things from up at Tippy Dam uh, every fall. Um, there are several police agencies that we serve. I'm sure everybody can figure out which ones they are, but the, the sheriff's office we deal with on a regular basis. Uh, the Manistee City Police Department, the Michigan State Police, uh, the Little River Police, and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources are the main agencies that we deal with. Um, part of our, our job at the office is to advise all of these departments. Um, as everybody here can imagine, the law is, is fluid, so it's always changing. So just because we know one thing about the law one day, doesn't mean that the next day that's going to still hold true. There are cases coming out from the Supreme Court all the time, and so we need to keep track of those and advise the agencies. And an example of that um, is a case a few years ago that came out of Arizona. It was called Gantt versus Arizona. And previously in law um, in, in Michigan and all of the states, when an officer arrested somebody who was in a motor vehicle, um, that officer could take that person, take them into custody, and then could search the whole interior compartment of the motor vehicle. It was what was called search incident to arrest. So that officer might be looking, that they might be arresting somebody on a drug case, they may be looking for drugs, they may be looking for weapons, but they can search anywhere that that person had access to in the interior compartment of that car. And oftentimes, the officers would find things, not things that the person was even arrested on. They'd find more, and additional charges would be brought based upon what they found. Well, in Gantt, uh, Mr. Gantt was driving on a highway in Arizona, uh, and his vehicle was pulled over uh, by local police. I think it was a minor traffic infraction that he was stopped for. And when the officer had contact with Mr. Gantt, uh, he ran it through the system, and lo and behold, Mr. Gant was driving while his license was suspended. So he was taken into custody, he was arrested, and he was put in the back of a patrol car. Well, pursuant to the search incident to arrest doctrine, that officer went through and searched the interior compartment of Mr. Gant's vehicle. And in the back seat, Mr. Gant had a jacket, uh, and the jacket was searched, and in the pocket, uh, there was some cocaine that was found. He was charged with it, and ultimately he was convicted of uh, possession of cocaine. And 
he appealed that and ultimately went up to the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court said in that case was, well, you arrested him for driving while license suspended. We don't think you can go through and search the whole interior compartment of the vehicle. Uh, we think that you can search the interior compartment of the vehicle, but only, only for evidence of driving while license suspended because that's what you arrested him on. Well, how does that play out practically speaking? Well, if you're arresting somebody for driving while license suspended, you are probably not going to be searching through their jacket in the back seat looking for evidence of that crime. I don't think anybody can make that argument with a straight face. So basically, with that decision, the court turned on its head the idea of search incident to arrest in a motor vehicle. It still exists, but it's been changed drastically. So how would that play out? If we have an officer on the road, that decision comes out, and that night they're on a traffic stop, and they don't know about this decision, and they arrest somebody for driving while license suspended, which happens all the time, and they're searching a vehicle after that, and they find a kilo of cocaine, or they find, say, uh, a murder weapon, or they find uh, some other contraband, um, that's going to be a problem. That flushing sound that I'm going to hear is my case circling the drain, because that search and, and the evidence that was obtained through that will all be, um, will be suppressed. So it's important for us to um, get word to our officers and the departments when, when those changes um, are taking place and, and let them know as soon as possible. Um, one of the questions I often get from friends and family, um, because we do on call as prosecutors, so um, we have weekend on call, we have nighttime on call, and I, and I often get the question, well, why are you on call? You know, you're not a physician. Uh, in the maternity ward and you know you're not going to have to rush to the hospital what could you possibly be on call for um, and there are several reasons um, and the reason I brought this up is because I get this question so much one of the things that we do is uh, we draft and review all search warrants um, and uh, for probable cause and there are a lot of situations that can arise uh, where an officer would need a search warrant um, an example would be if there's a crime, let's say, I know I've relied on this a couple times already, let's say there's a stabbing, um, and an officer has reason to believe that that weapon is within someone's home. Um, just because a stabbing occurred, and just because it may have just occurred, doesn't mean that that officer can then go kicking down that door to somebody's home and go in and say, I'm going in because I know it's in there. Um, that officer has to have authorization from a judge or a magistrate to do that. And the way that that person, he or she, will do that is contact us, we'll put all the relevant facts in, hopefully to establish probable cause about why we think that item is in there um, and, and why we think that it's an instrumentality of a crime. Um, and then that officer will take that search warrant and swear to it um, in front of a magistrate and, and hopefully get a signature to be allowed to, to go in and retrieve that item. Um, another time it comes up, comes up often on drug cases. Um, and with everybody's heard about the meth, the meth problem, uh, it's in all the counties in northern Michigan now. Um, and so if an officer were to get uh, word that from a, a reliable source that maybe somebody's cooking meth in a local residential area in a residence, um, <clears throat> that officer could try to put together a search warrant if he had enough, if he or she had enough probable cause. Um, and so they would contact us to do that. Um, other facts that may go in that search warrant, maybe there's a weird smell coming from the house, maybe people are coming and going at all hours of the night. Those are all things that we would put in there to hopefully establish probable cause uh, to get in and take care of that situation. Um, and the other thing is that uh, for on call, um, if there is a situation that develops, obviously you can imagine these things sometimes happen at 3 o'clock in the morning. and. They can't sit there and keep that scene secure until the next day when everybody's up and available uh, to come in and, and hopefully then get in their house. That has to happen then. Um, and if they don't secure that scene, what's going to happen? All the evidence is going to be lost because whoever's in that house or somebody, that, that evidence is there for a reason and it's meant to be hidden. Um, and so by the time, if we didn't act right then and there, by the time that we did, it would be gone. Um, <clears throat> another. Uh, duty that we have while we're on call is we answer legal questions from officers. There is no uh, shortage of situations that occur and sometimes when I think I've, I've seen it all, um, I get another question and sometimes I don't even know the answer, I have to look up. So 
Uh, they do rely on us to answer legal questions that they have uh, while they're on the road. Um, and also, the last thing is weekend arrests. Um, when somebody's arrested on a felony charge or a domestic violence charge, they have to be arraigned on that charge within 48 hours if they're being held in jail. So obviously you can imagine if an officer does an arrest on Friday night, um, we can't wait until Monday. We'll be well beyond 48 hours. Actually, we try to do it way before 48 hours. But we would be well beyond that if we waited until Monday. So what will happen is the officer will call the on-call prosecutor and say, hey, I arrested so-and-so uh, for this charge. And you tell them, have your report done in the morning. Meet us at the office. And we will, um, we will review uh, that complaint at that time. And um, once we do that, we can decide whether or not we're going to charge it. And if we charge it, uh, then what happens is the officer swears to it in front of the magistrate, and hopefully an arraignment over the weekend takes place. Um, the bottom line is that we don't have people sitting in jail when they're not charged. I mean, we, we can't have that. Um, that's basically the criminal aspect uh, in a nutshell. Uh, we do do some things that are more related to the uh, civil aspect in our office. Uh, one of them is that we represent the Department of Health and Human Services on child abuse and neglect cases. So um, if a child is found in neglectful condition and removed from a home, um, we have to have a hearing within 24 hours and initiate proceedings uh, to take jurisdiction of that child. And what will happen is that can ultimately go to trial for the court just to take jurisdiction of the child. And then if it's a termination case where the, the conditions are so bad and this child is so maltreated, uh, maybe beaten, who knows. Um, but if it's a termination case, then there will be another trial on that same uh, case to determine whether or not to terminate the parental rights uh, of that parent. Um, and obviously there are all kinds of timelines when you're, when you're dealing with children um, that are involved. Uh, the other thing we do is we do prosecute juvenile offenders in juvenile court, um, delin juvenile uh, delinquency cases. And the interesting thing about juvenile delinquency cases is that they are, juveniles are not treated the same as adults um, in our system. Um, the, the purpose of having a juvenile uh, in juvenile court is to hopefully rehabilitate them, find out what they need, find out what led uh, to them to act the way that they did, uh, as opposed to the adult court, which a big part of it is, is punishment and, and retribution. Um, and in fact, the terms are not even the same that are used in, they've tried to separate it so much that the terms aren't even the same that are used. Um, a disposition in juvenile court is basically a sentencing. An adjudication is a conviction. They don't even use the same terms because they want to, they want to separate them out uh, so much. Uh, the other thing, another thing that we do on the civil side is um, <clears throat> we initiate child support proceedings. Uh, you've all heard about the deadbeat parents that don't pay uh, to, to, to raise their children. Uh, they're maybe not present. Um, and what happens is you have a custodial parent who has the child who's receiving services. It may be welfare, um, it may be a bridge card, it may be Medicaid, but they are receiving all these services from the state to raise this child. Um, and what happens is when we find out about that, we will find out who that child's uh, non-custodial parent, the parent who's not paying is, and we will go after them. And we'll initiate proceedings in circuit court to get child support ordered uh, so that they have to pay. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about regarding the civil side of what we do um, is we initiate proceedings in probate court um, for people who are legally incapacitated. And what do I mean by that? Well, um, it's not uncommon to have somebody who maybe isn't in the right frame of mind. Maybe there's some issues going on and, and they've completely, for back, lack of a better term, lost it. They may be wandering in traffic. Uh, you may have somebody who locks themselves in, a, self in a closet for a period of three days and refuses to eat or come out. Uh, in those situations, um, we work with Central Wellness and a petition can be filed in the probate court um, to hold a hearing to get that person the help they need. What are the types of things that a court can do? Well, they can order medication compliance. Um, in certain cases, if it's bad enough, they can order hospitalization. Now, that hospitalization is usually temporary until the person 
um, stabilizes and, and can be returned to the community. But uh, if that is needed, the court can do that. And usually the court relies on a psychiatrist. We have testimony from a psychiatrist, the person's treating psychiatrist, uh, to talk about the types of things and, and, and why um, that doctor believes that this person needs an order for psychiatric treatment. Um, in talking to Bob and what I was going to talk about uh, here tonight, it indicated that one of the topics that he thought would be a good one is to kind of go through a typical case um, from arrest all the way up uh, through trial. So I, I kind of like to, to do a hypothetical here. Um, and let's pretend that you get caught breaking into someone's home. I know no one here would do that, but it's, it's a good hypothetical and it's a good interesting charge. So um, let's say that that happens and you're arrested and taken to the county jail. Now, you're probably, when the officer gets on scene, and assuming that that person finds you there, they are probably going to ask you some initial questions. At this point, you are not in custody because that officer is still trying to figure out the situation, figure out who lives there, figure out what's going on. Once that officer is able to figure out what's going on, and there are probably going to be multiple officers on scene, um, they will separate the witnesses and kind of find out what's going on. Well, now it's decided that you are the culprit, you're the, you're, you're the suspect, you're the one who, who did this crime. And so they're going to take you into custody. They'll take you to the county jail um, in the back of a patrol car, handcuffed. And once you get to the county jail, you'll probably, now not in all cases, but most, you'll probably be taken to an interview room. Um, and there might be some people now who are thinking, did I forget something? Did I forget Miranda, right? And, and, and there's a big misconception about Miranda, that Miranda has to be read before the person can be arrested or upon arrest. And, and it's a misconception we get it from defendants that say, I wasn't read Miranda when I was arrested. Well, Miranda applies to custodial, one, custodial, and two, interrogations. So basically, when you're under arrest and you're questioned, that's when Miranda attaches. And so um, what will happen is you'll be read Miranda, um, and everybody knows what that is, right? I mean, the right to remain silent, anything you, can, you say can will be used against you. Uh, you have the right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, one will be appointed to represent. Um, and so that will happen, and then it is, you'll have to make a decision about whether you want to talk to that officer or not. Um, amazingly, a lot of people do. A lot of people choose to. And I, I don't know why that is. Um, there are some people um, in some situations that they believe it's a misunderstanding, and sometimes it is, and sometimes what they say will help them, but not always. And so um, when you sit down with that officer, obviously that officer is going to have a lot of questions. Um, and it's, it's amazing. There are people that will volunteer more information than even what they're asked. And it reminds me of a, of a, of a case we had here um, a few years ago where a car was stolen from downtown Manistee. Um, I think the keys were left in it, but the car was taken. And the person who did it wasn't from the area, and they were trying to get back downstate. And they got as far as, I think, south of Ludington when the car ran out of gas. Mm. And um, so, Obviously, they left the car on the side of the road, and investigation happened. One thing led to another, and they found this person. And so they started questioning them about this, about taking the car, and, and why they did what they did. And the guy admitted, yeah, I took the car. Um, I needed a ride. I didn't have one. I took the car, and I drove it. And he then volunteered that he found some beer in the back of the car that was an open. And he took the beer and poured it all over the back seat of the car. Why? Because he was angry that the car he stole didn't have any gas in it. So um, he, he, he volunteered that, and I don't think that anybody would have ever known that in, until he told us. So um, in that situation, he had the right to remain silent, just not the ability. Um, and, and, and you see that quite a bit. Um, so, uh, now um, you have to decide again whether or not you speak with the officer. Um, 
But let's assume that this arrest occurs on a Friday night. Well, we now know what happens, right? The officer calls me. Um, I'll come in on a Saturday and I'll look at the complaint that's presented. And I can do one of three things when that officer shows up with a complaint. I can charge it. I can say, oh, yeah, this looks great. I think we've got all of our elements met for this charge for home invasion first degree. And I can charge it, in which case um, I'll sign a, um, a complaint and it'll go uh, to the magistrate for an arrest warrant where the officer will swear to it. Uh, the other thing I can do is I can say, you know what, guys, it's, it, it's not there. Uh, I'm sorry, that they're, they're, I don't even see a crime here. Um, and that's called decline. So, so it could be declined at that point if, if, you know, if, if it's just not there and we don't see the elements. And the third thing that can happen is I can look at it and say, well, yeah, I think I think that was there. There's a couple things maybe that we need to do yet. And, and you know, you need to interview these people or you need to do this. Now, the last two, two and three, if that, if two and three happen, you're not going to sit in the county jail. You'll probably be released um, in short or um, and, you know, obviously if it's further, that doesn't mean charges can't come later, um, but, uh, but you will be released. Um, so, but let's assume for argument's sake that we look at it and say, oh yeah, there's enough there, um, we're going to charge. Well, what happens then? Well, then you'll be arraigned and you'll be taken in front of the district court. And at the arraignment, the judge will tell you uh, what the charges are and what the maximum penalty is. So let's assume in our scenario that, that they, we found, oh, you went in with a weapon, um, you went in and you stole something, and it fits for a home invasion first degree. Okay, that's a maximum 20 year felony. So the judge would tell you that, um, and then the judge would address bond, because as of right now, you don't have a bond set, and so you haven't been able to post it. Once the judge does that, um, again, the judge will set a bond, and let's say in our scenario, he decides after hearing everything that he's going to set it at $50,000. And he's put a provision on there for cash, surety, or 10%. So there are three types of ways that you can post that bond to get out of jail because it's a very um, unpleasant place and you want to do whatever you can do to get out of there. So the first thing you can do is pony up $50,000 cash and pay it to the court and walk out of um, the county jail. How many people are going to do that? Hardly anybody. Um, the second thing is you can get a bondsman to post a surety bond. And basically what that is is the bondsman will post the $50,000 for you, um, but he will charge you, I think, I, I'm not even sure what the going in rate is right now, it might be something like 10%. So he may charge you $5,000 just to do that. And lastly, if the court allows you to post 10%, that's probably your best option because then you just have to come up with $5,000 and you, get, you post that 10% and you can get out. The kicker is, if you don't show back up to court, you owe the court the other forty-five. Not only do you owe the court the other forty-five thousand dollars, you lose the five thousand that you posted. So, let's assume um, that you're able to post. You get the ten percent. You're able to post the five thousand dollars bond. You get out, um, and you will have a court date coming up. Let's assume you've been arraigned already, um, and in between that point and your pretrial or earlier, depending on if you choose, you're probably going to talk to an attorney. Because um, for our scenario, we're not going to have you represent yourself, you're going to want to get an attorney. And I can say by and large, most people do on, on, the, on the really serious cases. They don't have to. You certainly have a right to represent yourself. Um, I don't recommend it. Um, and I think it was uh, Abraham Lincoln who said, uh, the man who represents himself has a fool for a client. Um, and, I, and I think that's really true. And I can even say, as an attorney myself, I think if I were in that position, um, I would also probably hire an attorney. And the reason is because you don't look at your own case uh, with the same objective eyes as somebody else would and somebody who can advise you. So in this scenario, let's say I hire an attorney. Well, what happens then? Well, we're still in district court. It's a felon. All, this, all felonies take place in circuit court, but they start out in district court. And district court is where the misdemeanors occur, and it's where the felonies start out. So you will be set for a probable cause conference in, in district court. That will be probably two weeks after your arraignment date. And what happens at the probable cause conference? You will show up uh, with your attorney, 
and your attorney will sit down with somebody from the prosecutor's office, either myself or one of the other prosecutors, and determine whether or not there's anything that can be worked out on the case. Um, a lot of cases there are, some of them there just are not. And so if there is nothing worked out, a week later, you'll have a preliminary exam in district court. And the preliminary exam requires that us, as the people, the prosecutor's office, to present probable cause to the judge that a crime has been committed and you are the one who committed it. So how do we do that? Well, we'll probably call some witnesses. Maybe there was somebody in the home at the time that it was broken into that saw you break in. Um, that maybe saw that you had a weapon, but we want to make sure that we satisfy all the elements of that crime, at least to a probable cause standard. We won't go through and have a whole trial, um, and we won't present any more witnesses than we need to, uh, but we do want to get it bound over to circuit court, basically transferred to circuit court. So if the judge finds that we've met our burden, um, he will bind it over to circuit court, and, and basically what happens then is for lack of a better term, the case kind of almost starts over because you get arraigned in circuit court then on the charges. So now you're in front of a different judge, you're on a different floor in the courthouse, um, and you're in front of a different court. Um, at the arraignment at circuit court, once again, uh, you will be told what the charges are, what the maximum penalty is. Um, at this point, we still don't have a resolution, but the next stage is probably going to occur about 30 days later, and that's going to be a pretrial conference. Um, I know I'm throwing a lot of information at everybody here, so if at any point you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Um, but the pretrial conference is another chance uh, to see if we can settle the case. And there's a lot that goes into settling a case. I know a lot of people are probably wondering, you know, plea bargaining, I hear a lot about it. What is it? What goes into it? Why do you do it? Um, and so I kind of like to take a little bit of time and talk about that too. What goes into plea bargaining? Um, and, and what kind of things do we look at when we're returning? Is this a case that's appropriate to reduce, or is it one that, no, we can't reduce this. This has to go all the way. Uh, we're not going to make any offers on it. And so usually, uh, where I start, where I like to start on these, on these cases, especially on serious felonies, is the first thing that I will do um, is I will score what's called score the defendant. And what that means is I can get an idea of where you would be as a defendant, where your sentencing guidelines would be. Now we've already discussed that it's a 20 year maximum felony, right? Is, is somebody gonna get 20 years on that case automatically? No, no, not necessarily. Um, that's, that, all that is is the maximum penalty so that you know the maximum amount of time you could spend in prison for that charge. That does not mean that you're going to get that. And so what, I, what we do to score defendants is Everybody has what's called a prior record variable. And so we will look at somebody's prior record and determine, do they have prior serious felonies? Do they have prior violent felonies? Do they have misdemeanors? And so we will look at all those things, and for everything that you have on there that's scorable, you will get points. Okay, so once we figure out what it is that you have on your record, and we will, we will find out because all that stuff we have access to. So even stuff that's out of state, a lot of times we're able to find that um, and we're able to use that. And so we'll get a number for the prior record variable. So once we have that, then we're going to look at the offense for which you're standing trial. And you figure out what is called the offense variable. And in order to figure out the offense variable, you look at a number of factors. Are there any aggravating factors? Are there any mitigating factors in this case? Um, is this a case where an adult preyed upon a child, or maybe somebody who is mentally handicapped, or, or disabled? Um, and so you look at all those things. Those would be aggravating factors. Are there any mitigating factors? Um, you know, again, was there a weapon used? Was there a victim who was moved from somewhere? Were they taken out of somewhere and placed somewhere else? Um, did you attempt to cover up this crime? Did you lie about it? Um, and so those are all things that are used. So once we figure that out, we can get the offense variable. And once we have the prior record variable and the offense variable, every felony has a class, a crime class. And there's a chart for that crime class. So um, a home invasion first degree would be a very serious felony. Uh, it's in a serious cl crime class. Um, and so we pull the chart for that. And we plug in the offense variable and the prior record variable. And um, say 
we do that and we get on the chart 2957. What that means is that your minimum term um, in prison on that charge would be anywhere, when the judge would be anywhere from 29 to 57 months, okay? So that's your minimum. So that means that if you behave yourself, uh, whatever the judge gives you, let's say the judge splits the difference and, and says, oh, you're going to prison for 39 months. That means that as long as you behave yourself in prison, um, you're probably going to parole in 30, 39 months. If you don't, the Department of Corrections can keep you um, in, until, you know, until your sentence is done. You could max out on that sentence, actually, technically. Uh, but most people um, are going to be, you know, whatever their sentence is on, on the minimum guidelines. And it used to be that these guidelines that I've, I've told you all about, these used to be um, basically mandatory guidelines. And that meant that if the judge was going to depart from those guidelines, he or she had to find substantial and compelling reasons and to talk about those on the record about why they didn't go along with these guidelines. Uh, recently, um, there's been case law in Michigan by the Supreme Court that has stated those guidelines are not mandatory, they can only be advisory. Um, so now they're advisory, but what we found in practice is that most of the judges will still follow them mostly. You, you, can, you can bet that if you come up with a 29 to 57, your judge is probably going to be somewhere in there because it's a guideline for them too about where they should be. So getting back to how factor or, or put together whether or not we're going to offer somebody uh, a plea on a case. Once I have that, then I can take other charges, other charges that I think that are appropriate, other charges that would fit. Maybe they don't have a 20 year maximum, maybe it has a 10 year maximum. I can take that charge and I can plug all those same factors in again um, and I can come up with a different number. Well, let's say I do that and I get 19 to 38. Um, the question for me then is going to be, am I willing to sacrifice the 29 to 57 for the 19 to 38? Can I still get what I want if I don't try this case? If, if, I, if I make an offer, can I get what I want? So that's kind of where I start, uh, but there's a lot of other factors that go into it. Um, obviously, in our case, somebody's home was broken into. Somebody's home was broken into and the perpetrator had, had what? Had a weapon, right? Um, whether it's a gun or a knife, I don't know in our scenario, but they had a weapon. So that's incredibly life-changing and scary for somebody. And what we will do, um, especially in these serious cases, is we will have that person and their family or whoever was involved, whoever wants to discuss this case, we will get them into the office and we'll talk to them about it and determine what their feelings are. What do you want to see happen to this person? Ultimately, <clears throat> we make the decision, but we take into account and we give a lot of weight to uh, what that person wants to see happen. Um, and and it's, it's very common that we may have multiple meetings in the office um, before we even decide whether or not we're going to do anything on that case as far as a reduction. Um, another thing that I will do is evaluate the strength of the case. And part of that is I may talk to witnesses. I may, because I've got what happened in the police report, right? We all know the officer's going to put um, what that person was told at the time on the scene. Oftentimes, it's not uncommon for that to change drastically when you go and interview your witness. Um, and it's not that necessarily witnesses would be lying. Um, they may not remember things. They've just been, you know, they've just experienced this extreme trauma. And so they're talking to somebody right after, and they, their head is probably spinning. And so you've got questions, well, are they going to remember everything? Are they? And so you can talk to your witnesses ahead of time and kind of find out you know, what they're going to testify to. Um, and, and so that would be part of the same, same thing. Yes, in the back. Are you telling us what you personally are seeing as a job? Or is this legal advice you're giving to the people that you make all these steps? This is, no, this isn't a legal requirement. This is not a legal requirement. This is, um, this is something that we do as a matter of course. Um, contacting the victim um, prior to plea agreements, um, if they have requested, would be a legal requirement. Um, initially, when somebody's charged on a case like this, we send out a packet, what's called a victim's rights packet. Um, it goes out to everybody on the victim crime. 
And they can choose to return those forms to us um, if they want. If they do that, then, then we're legally required to contact them. On serious cases, um, you know, especially serious felonies like that, even if um, somebody does not return their packet, oftentimes uh, we will contact them. We will attempt to contact them. Sometimes they don't want to have anything to do with us. Um, other times they're very thankful that we did, and they're willing to come in, and they're willing to talk to us. Um, about how it's affected their life. And so um, I found that, you know, sometimes it, it just depends. Everybody behaves differently. And, and, and sometimes they, they can't talk about it. They don't want to think about it. And so they, they ignore, they may be ignoring correspondence and mail. But if you can get them in and talk to them, um, I think a lot of times it, it proves fruitful. It helps with the case. It helps them. Um, and so that's why oftentimes we try to do that. Um, the other thing that, um, that I look at on, on cases and, and one of the things that we have to keep in mind when we're determining whether or not we're going to offer um, a deal on a case, I guess if you will, um, is on child sexual conduct cases, criminal sexual conduct cases involving children. Um, those are generally incredibly difficult cases um, just for the subject matter. Oftentimes our victims on those cases, they might be seven years old, they might be nine years old. Um, and so, with those cases, um, obviously, you're going to do a lot more um, hand-holding than you would when you're dealing with an adult. You're going to want to get that child in uh, with their parents, assuming their parents are not somebody who's charged in the case, obviously. Um, and you're going to want to talk to them, and you're going to want to meet them, and you're not going to talk to them about the case the first time that you meet them. You'll get some indication of whether or not they can do this. Is this child going to be able to get on the stand and talk about it? Because that's what's going to be required, ultimately. And, 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 you know, I know it's, it's, it's hard, it's incredibly hard to do to have to put children up on the stand. Um, we do it if we have to. But what we look at on cases like that is a cost-benefit analysis. Can I get what I want on this case uh, without putting this, this young child on the stand, without putting them through this? And um, if you can, great. I mean, on cases like that, what are we looking at? We're looking at a, a, a lengthy prison term. Um, eventually the person is going to get out, but then they need to be on the sex offender registry and all kinds of other things. So we want to make sure that if we're fashioning something, again, it's a cost-benefit analysis. We have to be able to, to ensure the safety of the public and, and the safety of kids in the future so that this person isn't out. Um, but yet on the same, you know, in the same breath, we've got this child here that we're gonna, that's going to be subject to cross-examination by a defense attorney. Um, about what happened and you know well, what did he do well how do you know that, that it happened that way and all that all those things so um, again don't, th that's particularly um, I think it applies more so in criminal sexual conduct cases involving children than it does other types of cases but um, that's another thing that uh, that we look at now in our in our scenario um, I kind of got, got off topic there for a little bit talking about police but let's assume uh, that there is no resolution of the case at the pretrial. What happens then? Well, then it gets set for trial. We probably already have a trial date at this point. So at the trial, um, depending on, on how much press the case has garnered, because if it's garnered a lot of press, guess what? We gotta bring in more jurors because more people have heard about it. They may have colored their opinion on the case. And so you want jurors that are gonna be fair and impartial. And so we may bring 70 people in from the community. Probably everybody here has either been called for jury duty, maybe some of you have sat on juries, so you may be familiar with how it works. But um, we'll bring those people in. We're going to see 13 jurors on a felony case. Um, and the reason is normally you'd see 12, uh, but there's an alternate uh, in case somebody gets sick. But we'll be able to ask them questions. Um, and. You know, obviously, I want to know when I'm asking jurors questions. Those, those questions aren't asked to pry or to be nosy. I mean, they sort of are because it's information that, that is relevant, and, and I want to be sure that some things maybe that have happened to people in the past haven't colored how they're going to feel on this particular case. And so, um, so you know, I'll get five what are called peremptory challenges, and that means that I can kick somebody off a jury um, for any reason whatsoever five times. Um, it has to be a legal reason. You, you know, you can't kick somebody off based on race or based on gender or anything that would be illegal. 
But but if if you know if there's an attorney that doesn't like the answer to a question or thinks that maybe they don't really like the demeanor or maybe there's something that happened in the past that's going to affect how they believe you're going to vote on the case without even having heard any evidence, um, then in that situation obviously you can exercise your right to challenge. Um, there are some things that are fairly new creations that we've encountered in jury selection and things that I usually try to keep track of and get a handle on. And one of those is the CSI effect. Does anybody know what that is? Has anybody heard of it? Um, we talk about it in legal circles a lot. Um, the show CSI, I, how many are there now? CSI New York, CSI Miami, CSI Duluth. I, there's a million of them. Um, and I know a lot of people get really into these, these crime dramas. And, um, and that's fine, but what they have done is, if, if anybody's ever seen CSI, some of the stuff they do on the show is absolutely amazing. It's technology I wish we had, um, but it simply doesn't exist. Um, some of it does. You know, we do have DNA, we have, you know, they, they can do things like that. It doesn't come back right away. It might take us a year to get DNA back on a case. Um, and if you've been following papers and, and cases that have DNA, you know that. Uh, but it's amazing the stuff that they do in these cases. So what I found is that people who, who really watch a lot of these shows and get into it think that that's kind of how things work and, and that's what's possible when in reality it really isn't. Some of that science doesn't exist yet. Um, and so usually I'll try to ask people about that and during selection kind of explain, um, you know, that, you know, the situation that, that, that you know, you're not going to see that type of evidence. The other um, issue that we have with it is that a lot of our cases are not science-based. Some of them are. We do use DNA evidence, we do use blood evidence, we do use fingerprint evidence, um, but a lot of them are not. And let's go back to um, the case that I had talked about um, regarding the, the child um, sexual assault victim. Let's say that that person, when it happened, let's just say they were nine years old. Um, what we find in those types of cases is that child may not disclose that for four years. Um, doesn't mean it didn't happen, um, but it's, it's, we see it over and over again, and, and obviously um, psychiatrists and therapists can explain why that happens, but it is something that happens. Well, what happens four years later when we're presented, the child finally discloses to maybe a school counselor or somebody that, that this happened to them. Maybe they're acting out in, in on a case like that, you're relying on the testimony, um, and, and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. You, testimony is evidence. It's testimonial evidence. There could be circumstantial evidence. Maybe, maybe something happened during that time, and maybe there was a family member that said, "Oh yeah, I saw her really upset about that time. I, I, I didn't know what it was, and she wouldn't tell me." You know, these are all things that are very important in a case like that. Um, but if somebody's expecting, well, I, I'm still waiting, I haven't seen the DNA evidence, I haven't, I haven't seen the scientific evidence, where is it? And, and, and it's never coming because in a case like that, uh, you're not going to have it. And um, what we try to make sure is that other types of evidence are not discounted, even though it might be a case where you don't have scientific evidence. Um, <clears throat> so, no, why would it take up to a year? The lab backed up, Michigan State Police Lab. Um, the only lab that we have that will do that is the Michigan State Police Lab. And um, with the amount of homicides and, and sexual assaults within the state of Michigan, um, for a while the lab has been really backed up. It's gotten better. They've hired more people. Everybody's heard about what happened in Detroit with the untested kids. Now that was the city of Detroit. But I know that I think the state has stepped in to help out and they've hired more uh, lab techs. In, in, in those cases, the DNA, the analysis of the DNA is not real simple. It's done by people that have a lot of training, a lot of scientific training. Uh, a lot of them, I think, are PhDs, um, or at least master's level, and, um, and they're analyzing this stuff, at least to my knowledge. And so what happens is they try to prioritize cases. Um, you know, if you've got if you have a murderer on the loose and you don't know who did it and you may have some DNA, that's going to jump to the top of the line, but it's a long line. And so um, they try to keep up and, and you know, it's, it's just, that, that's what we found. It, it may not be a year anymore, it might be down to six months, um, but it does take some time. And, 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 you know, it's just that these labs are, are backed up. Does the case proceed before 
Often, oftentimes, oftentimes it does. Oftentimes it does. If there's enough um, to go forward with with what we've got, if we know, if, if we think we can prove this case, and, and there's enough here based on everything, yeah, it would be nice to have DNA. We don't have it yet. We know it's at the lab. We know it will be done by the time this case goes to trial. Um, absolutely, um, we, we would do that. Uh, there might be cases where we don't have enough. Um, there might be cases where we don't have suspects at all. Um, and we have DNA, and, and, and sometimes um, there's, a, there's a database called CODIS where they keep track of um, DNA. And when somebody's arrested for a felony, their DNA is taken. Um, there was a case uh, in Washtenaw County. I used to work down in Washtenaw County in Ann Arbor as an assistant prosecutor. There was a case down there where a guy got arrested in, I want to say either St. George or Kalamazoo County. And they, it was, a, I think it was a check case, and it was a, it was a felony check case. They ended up taking his DNA. He got convicted. They ended up taking his DNA. They entered it into this CODIS DNA database, and lo and behold, they got a hit for a murder that happened in Ann Arbor, I think, in 1969, if I'm not mistaken, 1970. And that was right after they started actually taking, being able to take DNA. So it was a long time. Ago. I may not have been quite that long ago, but it was a long time ago. Um, and they got a hit, and lo and behold, um, it was a cold case, uh, and they ended up convicting the guy. They went back and re-interviewed witnesses, um, and completely opened up the case. At the time, they never had a suspect. They were never able to interview any of these witnesses, this guy's roommates. Um, they were never able to do any of that um, because they had no suspect. They had no idea who it was. And when the technology caught up, um, they were able to. They were able to analyze that and do that, and it, it was pretty amazing. Yes. If someone gets uh, probation or parole or hard time, and they do their time, they're released. Say five years later, is there any difference in who shows up again? As far as who shows up again, as a as a criminal. Um. If if somebody has if somebody has done their time and they've, they've completed their sentence and they come back again, are you asking, if you, are they punished further? Um, no, I mean, you got, say, three people that had the similar crimes, and one went to prison, one got probation, parole, or intensity parole, or just nothing, they let them go. Yeah. Five years from now, is there any difference in the people who come back into the system? Have they learned anything? Um, in my experience, very little. And, and, <laughs> I, I hate to say it like that. Um, it seems like there's a fair amount of recidivism. Um, I've been with this office now for almost 10 years. So I've seen people go to prison, serve their time, return to the Manistee community, and do the exact same thing that got them sent there. And they end up going back. And, and, and there's a term for that, it's called life on the installment plan. Um, and, and it really is. It, it, and you see it, not only do you see it with serious offenses with prison, you see it with people that go to jail. And you'll see people go to jail um, for relatively minor offenses. And, and, and I, I, I say that, I mean, I know no offense is really minor, but, but you know, there are levels. And so let's say you have somebody on a drunken disorderly, um, you know, maybe the average person, ah, oh, I did something stupid. Maybe they spend the night in the drunk tank, come out, do a few months of probation, and they're done. Um, but you see people that will do um, two weeks, they'll get out, then they'll go shop with something, they'll be back in um, until, you know, they're serving the maximum sentence on these misdemeanor crimes, you know, so you've got somebody sitting there for a maximum 93 days or a maximum year, whatever it is, um, and then they also have probation violations for all the other minor offenses that they're on, and it just, it's just, it snowballs, and it seems like, you know, they close out one case and they open another one, and it's, it really is, uh, that's life on the installment plan, you know, basically minor offenses. So we see that too. Most people graduate to serious offenses though after a while. I have a question for you. How many uh, jury cases do you, does your department handle in a year? Oh, um, last year, I want to say I don't have exact numbers. I think we were probably in the neighborhood of six to eight. Um, so far this year, we have reviewed right in the neighborhood of 1,200 warrant requests, 1,200 warrant requests. That's police reports with requests for charges. 
Um, probably about somewhere in the neighborhood of two to three hundred are probably felonies, and the rest are probably misdemeanors. Do you have any uh, coming up in the next few months? We have a, a large number coming up in the next few months. I'm not sure you're going to just carry Well, then, then, then I'm not going to tell you anything because um, <laughs> about what we've got. Uh, but yes, there are cases coming up. There, I'm sure there are civil cases coming up. There are a number of criminal cases coming up. Um, but uh, but yeah, we. Uh, I try to. Oftentimes, when I know I've got something coming up, I it, and I always have to be careful what I say about cases anyway. But I try to be very careful about what I say and who I say it to, because Manistee is a small community. And I never know who's going to be on the jury pool. So, um, but yeah, we um, we're we're keeping pretty busy. Based on that, the other thing that I, I didn't really mention is that one thing you can do also is you can choose a, a trial by judge, which is called a bench trial. It operates the same way. The only difference is um, we don't bring uh, juries in. The judge decides to hear the case. Usually, it's the defendant who decides that they want that, um, and you know, basically, the judge. And most of the cases that go to trial are not made to bench. Most of them are jury trials, but um, we do do the occasional bench trial as well. Um, Yes. I had another question uh, about the bondsman. It's you know you said that you know if you have a fifty thousand dollar bond, it's ten percent of the right. bondsman. So that's uh, you know five thousand dollars. Yes. Now the bondsman is on the hook for fifty thousand dollars, correct? Yes. The bonding yes. company. Yep. Now do they you know do they take the title from your you know your your two thousand sixteen shows? Uh, Silverado Chevy. Probably. And your house. And yeah, yeah. 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 Rufus Salt probably does. But, <laughs> okay, so okay. basically they're collateralized then. I, I would think so. And, you know, I don't deal with those guys enough to know exactly how they do it or what. There's a lot of laws regarding that, and I, I'm not exactly sure what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. Um, I do know this. I do know that if you skip out on your bond, they will travel to the ends of the earth to find you, and they will find you. Um, they, they, you know, they don't have limitations on them as far as, um, you know, obviously we couldn't send a Manistee County deputy down to South Carolina to look for somebody because we think they're down there. We can have that Manistee County deputy call um, deputies down in South Carolina in the county we think the person is and say, hey, can you drive by this house? Hey, can you do this? Hey, can you do that? But, I mean, obviously we don't have the resources to send somebody around the country. They will, um, especially if they have that much money to find, and, and, and they're good at finding people. So, um, so anyway, in our in our scenario now, we've got a jury picked, right? We've got 13 people that are going to sit and hear the case about the home invasion in the first degree. Um, so what will happen is I'll I'll get up and I'll get a chance to speak and I'll be able to give my opening statement. Um, and basically, in my opening statement, um, I'll get to tell the jurors what I think the evidence will show. Um, I can't say, this guy's guilty. No, not, not at, 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 at that stage. I can say, this is what I, this, you know, you'll hear from so-and-so, and they'll tell you this. And, that. and so it's kind, of, it's kind of provide a roadmap for the jury so that the jury knows what the case is about and kind of what they're looking for. Um, the defense attorney will get up and be able to do the same thing after I'm done. So he or she will be able to get up and say, well, this is what we intend to show. Here's, you know, here's why the prosecutor's wrong, basically. Um, and after that point, um, we'll get to present our case. Well, how am I going to do that? Well, we've already talked about it some. I'm going to present witnesses, right? Uh, maybe there's photographic evidence. Um, maybe it's a DNA case. I don't know. Um, it's, it's, it's possible. Um, but on a home invasion first degree case, um, you know, I'll probably have a lot of witness testimony. Maybe the person has security cam outside that shows you going into the house. Maybe we have that, I don't know. Um, the other thing that's kind of um, changed evidence-wise now, or evidentiary-wise, is that a lot, almost all of the patrol cars in Manistee County are now equipped with uh, cameras. And so what generally happens is when that officer initiates a traffic stop and they flip on their lights, um, the camera tracks back, usually I think it's about five minutes, five minutes before. Um, and it'll say five minutes before that officer flipped on their lights. And it'll go throughout the course of the traffic stop until it's turned off. That is if it's functioning properly like it's supposed to be. Um, and they're not. 
So why would somebody, why would we want that camera to backtrack five minutes before that officer flips on he or she's lights? Well, because that's what caused the traffic stop. So whatever that officer saw, that camera's gonna catch because it's gonna back up five minutes. So let's say you have a drunk driver who's swerving all over the road. If that officer hits the overhead lights and the camera activates at that point and the guy pulls over, we, we don't have any of the bad driving captured on camera. Maybe that car swerved in the opposite lane and almost hit another car. None of, and maybe that's what led to the traffic stop. So it backs up so that we have that and we can get um, that video. And um, it's amazing how clear those cameras are now. They're full color and sometimes at night they get a little, but, but it's amazing. And they can burn those onto a DVD for us. And a lot of, um, I think the city police department is doing it almost as a matter of course now. Um, the sheriff's department, they all wear the, a lot of them, I think almost all of them now have the body cams. Um, and those are amazing because let's say an officer gets called to a domestic. Well, if you've got the patrol car video and you've got the patrol car going, it doesn't do you a lot of good when the officer gets out of the car and walks up to the house and starts talking to people and maybe, maybe he ends up going into the house, maybe he or she doesn't. But if you've got a body cam on, you know exactly um, what was said to that officer. And, and that's, that's come into play um, for us numerous times. And I've had, um, on domestic violence cases, we've had victims who basically recanted. And so we have charged their significant other, um, and then maybe she comes to court and says, no, no, it didn't happen that way, but, but you told the officer that, you know, he, he punched you across the face, or, or whatever, whatever the case may be. No, 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 I never said that. Well, guess what? The, the, the first place we're gonna go, uh, if we don't already have it, is gonna get that, that body cam of the officer who interviewed her. Um, and I can tell you that what it's gonna show is it's gonna show her saying, yeah, he punched me across the face. And so, um, so it's helpful for a lot of reasons. Um, and, uh, and so that's the type of evidence now that you may see, just depending. We don't always have that, and it just depends on the type of case. Um, but once we presented our case, the defendant will, defense attorney will get up and present their side of the case. Uh, we'll do closing statements and then uh, deliberations. And, um, you know, d depending on the case, um, jurors could be out for 35 minutes or they could be out for three days, depending. And, it, and it, you know, it's, it's always interesting, um, you know, to, to find out afterwards what they, what they talked about, what they thought was important, what they thought wasn't important. Um, it's a very interesting process. Um, if they come back guilty, you as the defendant have an automatic appeal by right. What does that mean? That means that you automatically get the opportunity to appeal your sentence and the Court of Appeals will look at it. Um, if you had pled guilty in that case, you'd have to ask for leave to appeal. Um, you wouldn't get to say, I pled guilty, now I want to appeal my sentence. No, the court would have to grant you, the appeals court would have to grant you permission to allow you to do that. But if you are found guilty, if you are convicted um, at trial, uh, then you get an automatic appeal by right. Now what happens if, yes? You made a comment a minute or so ago about the um, finding out what the jury thought what was important. At what point does that, yeah, does that happen in this process? That only happens after the case is done. Um, and depending on what court you're in, some judges allow the attorneys to go in and talk to the jury, the ones that want to. I mean, obviously, you don't, nobody has to talk to the attorneys if they don't want to. Um, but, but some people do. And um, some judges, a lot of judges, will allow the attorneys to talk to the jurors. This is after everything's done. Yes, the, the jurors are not necessarily released right away after the determination. Um, generally, they are. Generally, they are. Um, they're released um, basically once they have their, their findings, whether they say, we, the jury, find the defendant so-and-so um, guilty or not guilty, whatever it's going to be. Um, they'll be released shortly after that, but we will also generally be off the record right after that. So you might have attorneys milling around, you might have jurors, you know, they'll go in the back um, to collect all the things usually which are in the jury room and, and um, you know, sometimes some judges will allow the attorneys to, to talk to them at that point to just kind of figure out, you know, hey, what did you find compelling, what did you So it's like, it's informal. It's in, at that point, it's very important. Nobody has to talk. It's not, nobody's put on a hot seat. It's just if you, and, and some jurors really, you know, they enjoy it. They want to talk to the attorneys. They want to say, hey, here, here's what I thought you got right. 
here's here's where maybe you know and and, and you know that's that goes a long way because those are people deciding kids yes you <coughs> you said that sometimes the automatic appeal let's say that given 100 cases that are appealed how many might reverse um usually it's a pretty small number two um, percent something yeah probably it's, it's it's not a real big number um and there's a reason for that i think um in these cases, obviously, we're operating under a certain set of rules. Um, and there are certain things you can say in front of a jury and certain things you can't say. Um, for, for instance, an example, if I got up um, and I said in my closing statement, I made a public policy argument, okay? Um, that is, I, I kind of took it away from this defendant did this and here's why we know he did it. I say, Ladies and gentlemen, we can't let defendants like this walk our streets. We can't do it, um, you know, and, 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 and just proceed into a strong public policy argument. Um, that would be a problem. Uh, the good thing is that that's probably pretty rare. Everybody understands the set of rules that they're working under. And, um, you know, there, there are certain times in trials in, you can have a mistrial. Um, you can have a mistrial at the end because something comes out. Maybe somebody said something they shouldn't have said or maybe something happened that shouldn't have happened. Sometimes maybe it's the fault of somebody. Sometimes things just happen and it's nobody's fault. Um, but that stuff happens. But usually, I mean, most of the, most of the appeals on convictions, I think, a, a large number of them, most of them are upheld. Now, if the jury comes back not guilty, guess what? We're done. done. Because... Obviously, double jeopardy. Um, we can't retry that person. Um, we really can't appeal that. The jury has spoken. They've said not guilty. Now, that, that, that doesn't mean that the person didn't necessarily, I don't know if I should say it like this, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean, an acquittal doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't do it. What it means is we didn't prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. um, and there, I, I guess I'll talk a little bit about standards. I don't, I don't know what the time is or how much time I have. Um, but there are several standards that we have to prove a case by. Do you remember when I talked about the preliminary examination and how um, I had to prove by probable cause that that you that a crime was committed and you were the one who committed it? Remember that? Well, the probable cause standard is, is, is kind of way down here. It's not real high. Um, the next standard up would be by a preponderance of the evidence. Um, and that's a little bit more. You know, maybe you're talking... 51% that, that the person did. Um, next is clear and can, yes, go ahead. I appreciate a fully informed jury. Um, and the reason I say that is because I believe that when we, we have the burden as the people, and we have to prove the case to the highest standard, beyond a reasonable doubt, which is basically way up here. So obviously before we charge a case, we get a lot of cases, um, and they take a lot of time to review, but, but you have to do it on every single one. And, and I generally feel that when I've reviewed a case and I've charged it, I believe that I can prove that case um, beyond a reasonable doubt. And so my belief is that if I have a, a fully informed jury, that they know what's going on, that they understand, that they're a knowledgeable jury, that they're a smart jury, um, my belief is that they're not going to fall for tricks. Because I'm, I'm not going to use tricks. I'm going to present my case. Um, you know, what, what defense does, I, I, I don't know. But, but if I have a jury that I believe will understand what I tell them, um, or, or, or what the, not necessarily what I tell them, but what the witnesses tell them, um, you know, whether they choose to believe those witnesses or not, maybe another story. But I, I have always found, um, I look for informed, for, for informed juries um, and, and people that appear, to, you know, to, to, to really be smart. Yeah. What, what I'm referring to, and perhaps it's, it's not known as fully informed jury here, this jury notification that the highest power in the court is yes. the jury. Yes. Not the judge. Is the jury. That's you're absolutely correct. And jury nullification is always a concern. Um, and juries can nullify. And and you're absolutely right that the most powerful entity in that courtroom is the jury. 
And, that, and that's the beauty of our system. That's the great thing about our system, is because we're taking people from the community to come in and decide these cases. Now, where do we see jury notification? Um, depending on the type of case it is, I may look at a case and I say, oh, geez, um, you know, there's a good chance for jury notification on this case. Can you um, explain what jury notification is? Yes. Um, basically, um, when somebody's charged and we go in front of the jury, the jury is told what the law is. And oftentimes in jury selection, they're asked, you know, will you follow the law? Uh, jury nullification comes into play when the jury knows what the law is, but they say, yeah, but you know what? We don't really care about that. We don't think um, just based on everything that this defendant should be found guilty. Um, I understand what you're saying. I understand what the law is, but, but I don't believe there's a greater good here, and, and we don't believe necessarily um, that that person should be found guilty. Where we have started to see that somewhat, um, can anybody guess what type of case? Marijuana. We started to see that a lot on marijuana cases. Everybody here has seen the news. They've seen the, you know, it's kind of sweeping the nation, um, you know, the states that are legalizing it, and, and for all practical purposes, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically legal here if, you know, if you go get a card. Um, and so on those types of cases, uh, we, we try to hammer home that, you know, look, this is the law. It's up to the legislature to set the laws. Does everybody understand that? That, that you know, the legislatures are elected by the people, and, and these are the people who are, who are deciding um, the laws right now. Um, and, you know, sometimes you hammer that home, and, and everybody says all the right things, and, and then they do something else. So, um, you know, it's just, it, it's one of those things. Now, there are other types of cases where we might see jury notification. There are cases that uh, potentially we could charge um, but we don't. And, and, and what do I mean by that? Well, there are certain cases where we don't believe it would be in the interest of justice to charge. Um, maybe, and I don't want to pigeonhole myself here, but uh, maybe somebody who has a, a family member who was brutally attacked, um, and then they go and take action and do something. And I'm not saying that we wouldn't charge in, in a situation, but, but, but there are, as you can imagine, there are endless amounts of scenarios um, that could take place, and you could look at that case and say, yeah, we could probably charge this person, um, but based on everything that happened, they're almost more of a victim here. Um, so, so maybe we wouldn't do that. Now, say we take the opposite approach. Well, you know what, technically, we can charge if we're going to. That might be a case you get jury notification. Who would have power to notify a jury? Well, the jury itself. They would notify themselves? They would, they would, it's called jury nullification. Um, the jury is the one who's making the decisions. So the nullification really, um, I guess it's kind of a, the, the term isn't really an accurate description. What jury nullification applies to is a jury hearing the charges and, and basically saying, yeah, I mean, it fits and he's probably guilty, but we don't care. We're not going to find him guilty. And, and why might they do that? Maybe they don't think that the charge, maybe they don't think that the law that that person is charged under should be illegal. Um, and again, that's where, that's where it comes back to marijuana. There's a lot of people right now that feel, that feel you should be able to grow marijuana, you should be able to smoke it, you should be able to do whatever you want with it. Um, and so those are not the kind of people that you probably want sitting on a uh, marijuana grow case, for instance. Um, because guess what? It doesn't matter what you say, it doesn't matter. You're never going to convince them. So, yes? Does jury, does jury nullification occur when the jury does not believe the case was properly put together by the attorneys? Um, jury not necessarily no disagreeing with the law. But yeah, jury, jury nullification is more, um, I like it more to, well, the case was proven and the jury just doesn't care. If the case wasn't proven to the jury, I wouldn't really call that jury nullification. I just say that the jury, the jury didn't believe the case was proven. They, they didn't believe that the case was shown to them beyond reasonable doubt. Had they believed that, they would have found him guilty. But they didn't believe that. The nullification more applies to where a jury hears everything and they say, "Yeah, I get it. Uh, I just I can't get excited about it, and I can't see having this person, you know, serve jail time. Whatever." Um, so yeah, that's that's. 
I was on a jury, you know, five, six years ago now. It was a drunk driving case, the kid was 18, went through, and he was clearly guilty of driving drunk. He was caught sitting in the wheel of the car, he was drunk. We went through all the things. We originally all agreed the jury room that he was guilty, had a verdict, guilty, got out, the courtroom, one guy changed his mind. And after he was talking, he said, well, you know, the kid's only 18, he's going to college next year, he's got a, a hockey scholarship, I just didn't want to wreck his life. And boom, not guilty the way he went. That's he's clearly guilty. That's nullification right there. Because what he didn't say, he didn't say, yeah, you know what, I, I don't really believe that test. I don't believe the breath test. I don't believe that data master test. That's not what he said. What he said was, I don't really want to punish this guy. He's got too much going for him. And, and, and that's an example of nullification right there. So it's really verdict of nullification. Yes. Not jury yes. nullification. I think the way that that term, and, and that term has been used for a while. I didn't understand what jury yeah, it, it, Until Bob said that I didn't understand what jury nullification was. It, it's been used for a long time, and, and, and I think it refers to the jury actually nullifying, you know, the case. The, the verdict. verdict. charges of the verdict, yeah. Mm. Well, yes. well, in that situation, jury nullification, uh, what if uh, someone's family member was brutally murdered and another family member tracked down the person and killed that person and killed them? Would jury nullification slip in on that? Absolutely. Oh, good. I, I, mean, I mean, it could. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, that, 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 would be a, that would be a concern. Um, and, you know, that, that is problematic on those types of cases because obviously you can't, you have to, as a governmental body, as a prosecutor, you have to take action in situations, and you can't have people out just killing each other. And, you know, the, the case has got to play out, and it's got to go through the process. And, um, but certainly, that would be a concern on a case like that. Would it play out to nullification? I, I don't know. Hopefully not. Hopefully, you could get ahead of that in jury selection, and you can really hammer home and ask people about that, and, and, and you know, as, as much as the judge would let you get into it. Um, and, and we got people's feelings on it. Does, every, does everybody understand that we have laws for a reason? Does everybody understand you know, that people can be held accountable uh, to the letter of the law and, and it's the law that should handle things and not, you know, vigilante or, or, or however you're going to characterize it. So, yeah, that would, that would be a concern in a case like that, absolutely. Um, and, you know, another one where some, maybe some of these child's molested and then, you know, I mean, there's an endless amount of scenarios where that can come off. Are the judges on call on the weekend too? Um, the judges generally are not, usually there's a magistrate that's on call for the district court. So the magistrate is, is, is it's like a quasi-judge, a, quasi a magistrate is not a judge, uh, but they can sign search warrants. Uh, they can review them for probable cause. Who's not a magistrate? Uh, Tony Gorch, um, who is actually, I think tomorrow's her last day, she's retiring. She's been with the county for 40, 40 almost 50 years. 40, 40 50 years, yeah. And so um, we're actually going through a change right now, and I, you know everybody's a little bit nervous because we deal with the magistrate so much, and we've you know we've dealt with the magistrate for that long. She's been doing it for that long. She has everything down. She knows what she looks for, and, and it's a very smooth process. Hopefully, that will continue for the administration. What department is she? For? Di district court. She's an arm of district court. So she works under uh, currently she works under Judge Brunner. She worked under Jan Judge Danielson before that. Um, I will say that although the judges may not be in call, on call, if we need them um, and we can't get hold of the magistrate, we can usually call uh, one of the judges um, to, to review a search warrant. Usually a lot of times it's Judge Brunner, um, and, and he, he can be available to do that. Um, Does it have to be the judge in this county? Can it be a judge in Wexford or in the Lake or in uh, Mason County? Generally, we have used, um, we have used the magistrate in, um, in Benzie County because 85th District encompasses Manistee and Benzie. Um, so we have used that magistrate um, up there. It's still the same uh, district. I think you're probably, you want to go to the district that you're in. Um, you know, I mean, I suppose you could try to get a search warrant anywhere. I, I, I wouldn't want to do it. I'd want to, I'd want to use um, one of our local judges. There is a judge meet up in Benzie too. So. Um, I, I don't know that I've ever had a situation where we've been unable to get a hold of anyone. 
Um, sometimes maybe it, it take, might take an hour. Oh, I've got calls in there. I left a voicemail. Somebody will always call back. It seems like. So I don't know if you've ever had a, a huge issue that way. Uh, this one's not quite as passionate. <laughs> okay. Um, the uh, the bill bond system. I'm really not familiar with that. But um, in, in that situation, if you have, if, if the individual doesn't have the funds, those are the resources. You know, it's going to be probably an unusual situation. I don't know, but um, if they have to use a jail a bill, and it's ten percent and it's fifty thousand, means five thousand mm -hmm. dollars that they have to pay. That, that no matter what happens, they have yes. to pay. It. So if you go through the whole trial and you're found innocent, there's there's no refund. That is. No, no, that that, that five thousand belongs to the bail bondsman, and he's entitled to that because he put up his. 50 in order to ensure your release throughout the course of the trial. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it, it, you know, honestly, I don't even know if it's 10%. I thought that I had heard a while back it was. Um, you know, that's not an area that we have a lot of contact with because usually that's something that the defendant, um, you know, will undertake on their own. And, you know, and who, who are the bail bondsmen? I never see their ads in the newspaper. In the um, town, so. Yeah, I don't know if they advertise in standard classified newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know back I, I, I don't know. Business is a business. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, honestly, I couldn't even tell you. I've seen the names around. I think there's one called uh, Cozy Bail Bonds. You know, ironic name. You know. But uh, they're out of, uh, I think it might be out of Westford County. I mean, there, there's, there's, there are bail bond companies around here. Does, right. does the you know does your office say here's a list of them? Go help yourself type thing? Oh uh, right. no, we usually don't. Um, we have depending on what happens. Yeah, defense attorneys probably do. We we have we have limited contact um, with defendants, and, and part of that is is a product of the system because if somebody's represented by counsel, I can't talk to them. I can't talk to that person. I have to go through their counsel. It would be unethical uh, for me to talk to that person. So there are a lot of times, um, you know, and, and, I, and, and I think some of the crime dramas probably have the prosecutor talking directly to the defendant with no defense attorney present. That, does, that can't happen because if it does happen, I'm going to get in trouble. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, the integrity of the system is compromised. Um, so usually I'll go through and, and talk to the defense attorneys about cases. Now, if somebody's representing themselves and it does happen, Notwithstanding what Abraham Lincoln said, uh, people still don't take his advice uh, and they do represent themselves. Well, in that instance, if they're representing themselves, then certainly I can talk to them because they're acting as their own attorney. So um, if I couldn't talk to them, nothing could get done. Um, and uh, so then there's the difference. Yes. Two questions. One. Talk into the mic, though. Oh, okay. Well, I think so close, but I think it's going to be. Two questions. The first one you, you mentioned briefly about the casino, and, and that's I always thought of that as a, as a third world country or they did their own legal and everything. And then my next question is I don't know the jury advice, and you decide can okay, we don't want that guy in the jury, and he leaves. I'm trying to think back what that guy said or what did he do, and I for the life of me, I never could figure it out. But where yeah. are you guys coming from? I tell you. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I can address both of those. Hopefully, I don't know that my answers will be good, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, as it regards the casino, we all know that that's travel land, and, and that's considered um, it's it's considered different. It's considered different than, than state property or, or, or private property or, or anything else. And there is a very complicated set of laws governing. Um, arrests and what can happen uh, depending on who the suspect is, who the victim is, are they tribal, are they not tribal? Because if you have um, a tribal suspect and a tribal victim on tribal land, um, this, the state probably isn't even going to get involved because there is a tribal court, there are tribal police, um, and we generally don't even hear about those cases. If you have you know, somebody who is non-tribal, um, say somebody's at the casino and they do something, um, that is not, they, they, that cannot be handled by tribal court. Um, so that, that would be an example of a case that would be in the state system. Um, and so there's, there's a whole, you kind of have to look, there's, there's a chart um, 
regarding you know what can and can't happen depending on what type of crime it is and who is involved, whether they are tribal or not tribal. Um, I will say that by and large, most of the stuff that at least maybe it's because it's, they're the only ones I see. But from what I know, most of the stuff that happens out there, and, and you know, it's not a ton. We don't get a, a huge amount of cases from out there. We do get some. Um, but most of it comes, I think, through the county. Um, there are instances out there where um, a person who is not a tribal could be charged in federal court. Um, and so it, it's, it's, it's kind of a complicated area. Um, but I, I would say that probably most of the stuff that happens out there goes through the county. Um, as it regards your, your second question about um, jurors, it, it's, it's a really good question because oftentimes people get kicked off a jury and that's exactly the response. What did I do? I, 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 you know, I, they're, they're almost offended because, you know, if it's a criminal case and, and you know, the prosecutor keeps them off, well, you know, I, I'm pro law what, what? Or if the defense attorney, you know, I can be fair, I can be fair and impartial. Um, and oftentimes it's nothing that the person did. Um, there are any number of reasons that an attorney can exercise a peremptory, and everybody operates different. Um, there are attorneys who will call me in and say, you know, the first 12 in the box, those are the ones I want. I'm not even going to ask any questions. Quite frankly, that's probably no practice, but, um, <laughs> you know, there are people that subscribe to that. Um, you know, and, and it could just be a feeling maybe that that attorney got, or maybe um, they misread some body language. Um, the bottom line is that there are other attorneys who say, okay, I'm going to get five peremptories on this felony case. I'm going to use them all. Um, most people are probably in the middle. Um, why? Because guess what? If you use your four peremptories and you have one left and you kick somebody off with your fifth peremptory, right? You have no more. Who's going to get seated in that spot? You don't know. So now you're playing big casino. And that's the last thing you want to do on a case like that. So, um, I know that doesn't really answer your question, but, but I, I guess, um, you know, th there is, sometimes there's a rhyme or reason to it, and sometimes there's, there's not. Um, you know, there are things where um, somebody could get kicked off and it could be pretty obvious why. Um, I think a while, guys, this was a number of years ago, I had uh, a drunk driving jury trial and we had the whole uh, panel was in the courtroom and there were, I think, seven, because it was a district court case, right? So you have six jurors that hear the case, but you have seven for an alternate. And I had, I think I said something, in fact, I was questioning the jurors, and I said, um, is there anybody here at the time, I, I, I think the law was still 0.08, it was, it was after that change from 0.10. I said, is there anybody here that thinks that um, 0.08 um, is, is too low and that it should be higher because I think it had, it had switched from 0.10 to 0.08 and I was concerned that people would think, well, it's 0.08 now. It used to be 0.10, is it really? So I think I had asked a question like that. And I got a juror that said, well, no, as a matter of fact, I think it should be Point. I think any amount of alcohol in your system is too much to be behind the wheel. And quite frankly, I think 0.03 uh, is too high. And the reason I say this is because I'm an MD and I've read the studies. And well, guess what? That one's pretty obvious. Who's kicking that guy off, right? <laughs> Not me. But, uh, but, but yeah, he was thanked and excused for his time. Um, so, so, you know, there are times that it's, it's pretty obvious, and, and there are other times that it's not so obvious, but um, the thing that we always try to get across to jurors is never to take it personally. Um, if you're not selected, just, I guess, consider, you know, <laughs> exercising your civic duty. Um, and, uh, you know, because you know, a lot of times you get asked about your past and things, and, you know, have you, have you been involved in, in, in anything or have you been a family member? And, you know, all that stuff is looked at. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I wish I could give you a better answer. But, yes? Sorry. Okay. Um, you mentioned home invasions a few times. Yes. And, you know, it seems like somewhat frequently on the news we hear about home invasions. Yeah. And I 
think within the last week, there was a home invasion, maybe in Kingsley. Two fellows broke into a home. The homeowner shot both of them. I think killed one and did the other one, oh. according to the news reports. Uh, and so, you know, you, you start to think if that happened to you, you know, uh, how should the, the homeowner handle this? So, I uh, just while I was thinking of that, I was going through a magazine and came across an article kind of related to this. And they were talking about, uh, you know, a, a homeowners in this situation. And probably one of the first things that the homeowner would do would be call 911 mm -hmm. and report it to the police. But in this particular article, it was evidently written by some attorney, they said if the homeowner does call 911 and report it, that uh, he has given up his, his right to remain, society, remain silent and his uh, uh, Fifth Amendment right to self-incrimination and that anything that he says on the 9-11-9-1-1 tape uh, could or would be used against him. So if, I don't know if this is true or not. If it is, then what should a person do to protect herself? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Um, anything, and, and he's correct in his assertion that anything that is said on the 9-1-1 tape um, is, is probably going to come in. Why? Um, because at that point, Miranda doesn't apply, right? Because he's not in custody and he's not being questioned. And so, oh, he might be being questioned by the dispatcher, but really he's initiated that contact with the police. Um, and so it, it, it poses, it, it puts, in, in, I know that um, in the CPL classes, they go into this in greater detail. Um, and, and, you know, I, depending on the CPL class, I guess, I don't know take them in here, but um, it, it does pose uh, some difficulty for somebody, um, but the alternative um, is that if you don't call and then the person is laying on the floor and bleeds out where otherwise they might have lived, then, then you may have bigger problems too. So, um, you know, it, 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 it poses kind of a conundrum. I have found that it seems like um, in most of those situations, the people do call 911. Most of the time, those are law abiding citizens. Sure. And, and of course, somebody broke into their home and they say, hey, you know, I shot somebody and they broke into my home. Um, and, and, you know, that's going to be up to, first of all, the investigating officers when they're taking statements um, to compile all that information. Um, any case in which somebody is killed is probably going to go uh, to the prosecutor's office for review. Um, and, and that's not to say that necessarily that people are going to be charged, but it's, it's, when it, it seems like a lot of times, anytime there's a death, it's always reviewed. And, and so depending on where you're at, um, that prosecutor may say, you know, well, the guy was obviously defending his home. Um, is, that, is, is the 911 call going to be something that's looked at in determining um, whether or not there are charges? You got you. You got it. Because if that person is panicked and scared and they're screaming and that somebody's about to get their family, um, is that going to play, uh, you know, a role in whether or not the charge of PCI is? Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure what the alternative would be if that happened to, to say, well, I'm not going to call 911 because I don't want it to be used. I mean, could you, I suppose you could have a family member call 911. Um, that is not your statement. Uh, that's assuming you're, you're, you're home with somebody. Yeah. In this article, they were talking, and I don't know if it, if it in the article, they were talking uh, about a 911 Limited Immunity Act. And mm -hmm. I don't know if that's been enacted in any state, you know. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever heard of that or, you know. Yeah, um, it, it, it hasn't. Um, I, could, I could see that it being, being looked at in that situation. Um, we, we use 911 calls quite a bit. I can tell you probably 95% of the time um, they're not used against the person calling. Um, and, and, and that's just a, that's a product of, usually it's the person that's injured or the victim that's calling 911. And, and you know, the reason they're calling is to get help. So usually that's the person who's going to be the victim on the case. Um, the situation that you raise is, is kind of unique to that situation where potentially is there liability yet? Yeah, there could be. 
Um, and again, I don't know what the answer is, but the alternative to not calling 911 is probably, I mean. If a person was uh, in that situation, uh, should they uh, engage a defense attorney soon? Um, that would be something that they'd seriously want to consider. Um, and, and the reason I say that is not necessarily because maybe they didn't even do anything wrong, but, you know, a defense attorney is going to be able to advise them um, of the law. And, and you know that applies to a lot of cases where, um, you know, it's, it's just a level of expertise. And, and the other thing is that oftentimes when people are in these situations, they have a lot of questions. They have all kinds of questions. And if you don't have anybody to answer those questions, how do you know how, how you're going to perform? How are you going to proceed? Yes. Um, if, uh, I was just wondering if, uh, you know, being a Tea Party member, if you'd be interested in removing me from the jury pool. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Jason. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very informative. Um, okay, very brief, and we're running a little late. Uh, this is our last meeting of the year. Our next meeting will be uh, Thursday, January 17th uh, of 2017. So, the afternoon of the Sierra Tea Party, we just want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we'll see you next year. Five o'clock on a Tuesday, they're putting some stone down in the shack down here at Jones and River. So far, so good.
jacking up the uh, track so it's going to be level with the road. Actually, it's going to be about a quarter inch above the road. You can see that little plate they have there. see uh, men working on a railroad. The tracks don't remind me of the movie came out. Arguably the best movie ever. Blazing Cattle. Love that movie. Go to the video store, get blazing tatters. Definitely not the version I saw at the theater. This is the part up on the seat. I've seen a video of these things where they got many of these things that go down 20 feet at a time.
we'll see you this on CNN.
this guy's job title is uh, eyeballing guy. checking the other track.
on by between the tracks and that's it. down here, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Everybody just went, took a break. We're gonna cut a little rail here. Push it, uh, what? Yeah, 